Hi everyone, in this video I want to give you an introduction to integrals. And while they're not used as often as they are derivatives in economics, they're still used enough that we want to make sure that we understand their basics. So anyways, this video is what is an integral? So anyways, um, now that we're done talking about derivatives, we need to spend a little bit of time talking about the dichotomy of a derivative, the integral. And a dichotomy is just you know, the opposite, doing, going, going backwards. You know, the dichotomy of addition is subtraction. The dichotomy of multiplication is division. Anyways, our integral, or sometimes it's called an antiderivative, it's a method for moving backwards from the rate of change of something to the total amount of change. So it's going to be useful when we, when we talk about things like welfare effects. We're able to calculate uh, the total amount based upon how it's changing. But anyways, we're gonna find that integrals come into two different types. We have indefinite integrals and definite integrals. So in indefinite integrals, they're gonna focus on a pure conversion back from a marginal variable to a total variable. And honestly, this is very rarely used in economics. I mean, basically, we're going to have a situation where with an indefinite integral, they're not going to have what we call an initial condition, and that's going to prevent us from having a precise analysis of that integral. So basically, if you think about it, when we were calculating a derivative and that derivative had a constant associated with it, that constant disappears in that derivative. When we integrate that derivative, when we move backwards, we don't recover that constant. There's no way of getting it out of the function. And so that loses some precision. And honestly, we're not really going to focus on indefinite integrals because they're really just not used in economics all that much. Definite integrals, on the other hand, are used quite a bit. So anyways, a definite integral is going to specify a range for the integral. And that's going to remove the problem of the unknown constant. Basically, with a specified range, the constant cancels out regardless of its value. So we don't even need to worry about that constant existing because it will cancel itself out. So it just doesn't even matter at that point. So anyways, uh, we're going to use definite integrals to calculate welfare, and especially for calculating expected value. Um, we use that quite a bit, and there are a lot more complicated integrals, to be honest. But anyways, whenever someone's interested in calculating an area underneath a curve, and you'll find that's more often than you might think, but anytime that happens, that's going to warrant the use of a definite integral. So anyways, we can define capital F of X as the definite integral of the function F of X from an initial point A to a final point B, as right here. That's all that's saying, is that capital F of X is the integral from A to B of f of x dx. Now I put that dx on the end of it because that tells us what variable we are integrating with respect to. That's going to become very more important, well much more important when we talk about multivariable integrals in a little bit. Um, that uh, dx is what we call the integrand. Anyways, we're going to calculate integrals using the opposite steps that were used when calculating derivatives. So what's neat about this is that it's going to allow us to reuse concepts like the power rule, logarithms, and the exponential functions. We just need to move backwards. In addition, we can also use those techniques we talked about in derivatives like the product rule and the chain rule to simplify our analysis. Um, we have different names for them though when we are dealing with integration. The product rule becomes integration by parts. Um, the chain rule becomes what we call u substitutions, but they're going to follow the same mechanics if we just integrate those functions. And that's actually how you derive those functions if you're interested in that. But anyways, visually, this is what an integral looks like. When we have some function f of x, we want to know exactly how much exists between point A and point B. And that's honestly just going to be the area underneath that curve. And if you can remember calculating consumer and producer surplus, we're interested in that area under the curve quite a bit. It's a very common calculation. So anyways, let's practice a couple of these. So let's calculate the area underneath the curve f of x equals x squared from 1 to 3, or the integral from 1 to 3 of x squared dx. So the first thing we need to do is we need to figure out the integral x squared, which we can actually do with the power rule. But remember, when we're using the power rule, we need to work backwards, which includes the steps of the, back of the power rule. I have to do them in reverse order. So now, in order to integrate this, the first thing I need to do is to increase the exponent of our integrand, x in this case, by 1. 
and then we're going to divide by the coefficient of our exponent. So everything I was doing in the power rule, I'm now doing backwards. Where I multiplied, I divided. Where I subtracted, I now add. And I do it in the backwards order as well. I, I change the value of the exponent first. So when I do that, I increase my exponent by one, gives me x to the two plus one power, or x to the third power. And I divide my coefficient, which is just one in this case, by the exponent, which is now three. That gives me my integral capital F of x equals one third x cubed. Now a great way to check this to make sure you did it right, take the derivative of that. If I don't get x squared, I did something wrong. And that's exactly what I'm going to do if I take the derivative of that using the power rule. All right, well that's the value of my integral, but because this is a definite integral, I now need to use my endpoints. So I'm gonna plug in my two endpoints, one and three. I'm gonna subtract the initial point from our final point. So in this case, plugging in one, capital F of one, one third times one cubed, that's just equal to one third. Capital F of three, one third times three cubed, that's equal to nine, because three cubed is 27, divided by three is nine. So to calculate the value of this in, uh, integral, the area underneath the curve, that's just my endpoint three, minus my initial point one, so 9 minus 1 third, or 26 thirds, which is roughly 8.67. And that's going to be the total area under the curve in this case. And that's it. That's all that's involved with calculating this integral. Well, that's pretty straightforward. Let's make it a little bit harder. Let's do a multivariable integral, because we'll deal with those too, especially in econometrics. These are, that's where these show up quite a bit. So let's calculate the integral of y over x with respect to x from 2 to 10 and with respect to y from 3 to 4. So I have a double integral right here. The integral from 3 to 4 to, uh, of the integral from 2 to 10 of y over x dx dy. So I have two integrands right here because I have two different integrals and I'm going to integrate this thing twice. But before we panic about this, before we see a complicated integral, know that this is still very straightforward. We're just going to use those techniques we learned in multivariable derivatives and apply them right here to a multivariable integral. So, first things first, let's focus on this inner integral. Let's work from the inside to the outside. And again, this is just like the backwards with a derivative where we work from the outside to the inside. Now we work from the inside to the outside. So, on the inside, because I, my integrand is x, because I have the dx right there, I want to integrate this function with respect to x. So I'm going to treat the y in this case like a constant and leave it alone. And in fact, one thing we can do, since y is a constant, or with a constant in general, is I can move it outside of the integral. And that's appropriate for any constant. So that gives me the expression y times the integral from 2 to 10 of 1 over x dx. Well, if I rearrange this inner term, that's just dx over x. And if you can recall, that's just the derivative of the natural logarithm, log of x. So my integral of one over x dx is just that, it's log of x. So all that's left to do now is plug in my uh, initial and my final points at both 10 and two. Subtract the initial point from the final point. So the, the natural logarithm of two is approximately 0.7. The natural log of 10 is approximately 2.3. Putting that together, my inner term is just going to be y times 2.3 minus 0 0.7 in parentheses, or 1.6y. Don't forget about that y term. We pulled it out of the integral, but it's still there. So be very careful with that. So that's it, that's our first integral, 1.6y. So that y remains untouched just because it was a constant in this case, because it wasn't our variable of interest. Well, all right, let's update our integral. We went from a case where we had two integrals, now we just have one integral. We have the integral of from three to four of 1.6y dy. Now, if you'll notice, after we integrated with respect to x, all instances of that variable x are removed from the integral, but the variable y really remains unchanged, and that's because we treat it like a constant. So now let's calculate our outer integral. So we're going to integrate 1.6y with respect to y. It's just a very, it's simply an application of the power rule. That's all it is. Um, we're going to increase the exponent by 1, so y squared, then we're going to divide by the exponent 2, and that gives us 0.8y squared. Okay. That's it, that's all we need to do to integrate that one. 
So now we're dealing with 0.8 y squared from, four, from 3 to 4. And that's how I've written it right there. That tells us that I have those bounds of a definite integral that I still need to consider. So all that's left to do, I need to plug in my two endpoints for y, and I need to subtract the initial endpoint from the final endpoint. Same steps as before. I'm just doing it a second time now. So plugging in 3 for y, I get 0 0.8 times 3 squared, which equals 7.2. Plugging in 4 for y, I get 0 0.8 times 4 squared, or 13.28. So now I just get the total area underneath my curve of 13.28 minus 7.2, or 6.08. And like I said, as before, we just follow the steps, and these calculations are very straightforward. That's all we need to do. It'll work every time. So remember, work backwards from what you know about derivatives and make sure that you're plugging in the bounds appropriately and at each step. So anyways, thanks for watching. And again, be sure to check out the walkthrough videos for some examples and step-by-step -step guides. Anyways, thanks for watching.